All right, welcome back, guys. Today we are going to letter 29, or yeah, 29, which is on the critical condition of Marcellinus. Marcellinus. All right, he says here, you have been inquiring about our friend Marcellinus, and you desire to know how he is getting along. He seldom comes to see me for no other reason than that he is afraid to hear the truth, and at present he is removed from any danger of hearing it. For one must not talk to a man unless he is willing to listen. That is why it is often doubted whether Diogenes, Diogenes and the other cynics who employed an undiscriminating freedom of speech and offered advice to any who came in their way ought to have pursued such a plan. So they've got this friend, uh, Marcellinus, and he, uh, he doesn't want to show up because he's afraid of the truth. He does not want to hear, you know, and how many times are you in a situation where you're doing the wrong thing and so you don't want to hear it? So he's not going to hear it because he's not coming to, to hear it. So he, he's, he's made himself scarce, right? And he's saying that, here's the thing, you, you shouldn't really be talking to someone who's not willing to listen. And this is a really good lesson, <laughs> right? Because what happens when you talk to people that they're not willing to listen? Well, they, they resent you and they, they don't listen, all right? So that's why he's, he's saying that, you know, some of the cynics, this other school of, of philosophy at the time, that they would just go and, and give advice to anyone, whereas the Stoics, you, you sort of had to come into their fold in order to, to hear what they had to say. They, these guys were just preaching on the streets, Right, and, and sometimes you see that today, and how effective is that? For what if one should chide the deaf of those who are speechless from birth or by illness? By you answer, but you answer, why should I spare words? They cost nothing. I cannot know whether I shall help the man to whom I give advice, but I know well that I shall help someone if I advise many. I must scatter this advice by the handful. It is impossible that one who tries often should not sometimes succeed. So he's saying that, look, what about this argument? What about the idea that, hey, maybe yeah, n everyone's not going to listen, but why not just the words don't cost me anything, so why don't I just tell people about about the thing? Well, you know, what, what's what's the reason to not? You know, there, there's sometimes surely it'll 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 help. He says this, this very thing, my dear Lucilius, is I believe exactly what a great souled man ought not to do. His influence is weakened. It has too little effect upon those whom it might have set right if it had not grown so stale. The archer ought not to hit the mark only sometimes. He ought to miss it only sometimes. That which takes effect by chance is not an art. Now, wisdom is an art. It should have a definite aim, choosing only those who will make progress, but withdrawing from those whom it has come to regard as hopeless, yet not abandoning them too soon, and just when the case is becoming hopeless, trying drastic remedies. So what he's saying is he's saying, look, actually, this is a wise man wouldn't do that. And, and here's why. Okay. Because when you just give your words out to anybody, the influence you have is weakened. All right. And so it, it's going to have such a little effect on, on those, those people, right? Uh, because it's, it's sort of grown stale. You're, you're talking about this. You're saying this everywhere. You know, people are tired of hearing it. They're tuning you out. He's saying, you know, an archer, he shouldn't just sometimes hit the mark, just shooting arrows everywhere, but he should only miss sometimes. So he should be pretty sure of his shot and only miss sometimes. That, that makes a lot more sense, okay? And he says that wisdom is, is actually an art like this, and it should have a definite aim. You should know what you're trying to do, right? Who you're going to be able to teach and who's going to make progress, Right? Not just wasting your words, not just talking to everyone and, and making it seem like like your what you have to say is cheap. As our friend Marcellinus, I have not yet let yet lost hope. He can still be saved, but the helping hand must be offered soon. There is indeed danger that he may pull his helper down. For there is in him a native character of great vigor, though it is already inclining to wickedness. Nevertheless, I shall brave this danger and be bold enough to show him his faults. So he's saying like th this guy... Their, their friend Marcellinus, he's still savable, but it, it's, it's, you know, the, the time is running out. And so he needs to, to help him and he's going to help him, but there's a chance that he might actually hurt the person trying to help him, right? Pull them down with him, which, which is the case in a lot of cases when you try to help someone, they end up bringing you down. So you have to be careful of that. He says here, he will act in his usual way. He will have recourse to his wit, the wit that can for that can call forth smiles even from mourners. He will 
turn the jest first against himself and then against me. He will forestell every word which I'm about to utter. He will quiz our philosophic systems. He will accuse philosophers of accepting doles, keeping mistresses, and indulging their appetites. He will point out to me one philosopher who has been caught in adultery, another who haunts the cafes, and another who appears at court. So what is he saying here? He's saying that, look, when I talk to him, I know what he's going to do. He's going to like be charismatic and he's going to joke about what I'm saying and saying, oh, yes, yes, you're right. You're right, Seneca. Yeah. But let me tell you about uh, this this philosopher. You know, is, is this philosophy even right? Is it even right? You know, I saw a philosopher the other day. I saw one of our friends and he committed adultery. So maybe if if what you're saying is true, then, then why would he do that thing? You know, maybe what he's saying is not true. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he's going to come up with a bunch of excuses for it, and he's going to turn it. And he's not going to listen to to what, what is being said. That's the, He already knows, because Seneca's smart. All right? He, <clears throat> he will bring to my notice Aristo, the philosopher of Marcus Lepidus, who used to hold discussions in his carriage, for that was the time which he had taken for editing his researches. So that Scarus said of him when asked to what school he belonged. At any rate, he isn't one of the walking philosophers. Julius Grassinus, too, a man of distinction, when asked for an opinion on the same point, replied, I cannot tell you, for I don't know what he what he does when dismounted, <clears throat> as if the query referred to a chariot gladiator. So he's he's going to use some some excuse, right? He, he's going to use this this guy to justify. We don't know what uh, Marsilius is, is doing here, but he's going to, obviously, he knows the argument already, Seneca is saying, right? That, that he's going to use this this other guy, this Aristo, the philosopher of, of Marcus Lepidus, right? And, and he's going to use this as an excuse, okay? In verse 7, he says, It is the mount, mount backs, banks of that sort for whom it would be more credible to have left philosophy alone than to traffic in her, whom Mar Marcellinus will throw in my teeth. But I have decided to put up with taunts. He may stir my laughter, but I perchance shall stir him to tears, or if he persists in his jokes, I shall rejoice, so to speak, in the midst of sorrow, because he is blessed with such a merry sort of lunacy. But that kind of merriment <coughs> does not last long. Observe such men, and you will note that within a short space of time, they laugh to excess and rage to excess. So what he's saying here is he's saying, look, whatever he does, I'm just going to adapt to it. All right. So, okay. I already kind of know what he's going to do. He's going to be making all these jokes about this and I'll just laugh. I'll just laugh with him. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe I can move him to tears. Maybe if, if I don't offer so much resistance, then maybe I can actually get through to him. Right. But he says that, you know, yeah, if he does this, then <laughs> I'll laugh at his lunacy because it's it's ridiculous. But just know that that, that kind of stuff, it doesn't last very long. So if, if you're trying to hide from the truth and you're just making jokes of things, eventually uh, it, it it gets to the point of rage to the excess, laugh to the excess, where uh, we're, we're at that point. It, it's no longer fun. It's no longer a game. In verse 8, he says, It is my plan to approach him and to show him how much greater was his worth when many thought it less. Even though I shall not root out his fault, I shall put a check upon them. They will not cease, but they will stop for a time, and perhaps they will even cease if they get the habit of stopping. This is a thing not to be despised, since to men who are seriously stricken, the blessings of relief is a substitute for health. So he's saying, I'm going to come to him and I'm going to give him the truth. And you know what? I'm going to tell him, look, when everyone else thought you were not so good, that's when you were actually the best. Like whatever you're doing now, you're gaining favor from other people. That's not it. And yeah, he, he's he's not going to stop completely, but maybe he'll stop for a while. And maybe after stopping for a while, that, that will result in him stopping completely. So he says in, in verse nine, so while I prepare myself to deal with Marcellin Marcellinus, do you, in the meantime, who are able and who understand whence and whither you have made your way and who, for that reason, have an inkling of the distance yet to go, regulate your character, rouse your courage, and stand firm in the face of things which have terrified you. Do not count the number of those who inspire fear in you. Would you not regard as foolish one who was afraid of a multitude in a place where only one at a time could pass? Just so, there are not many who have access to slay you, though there are many who threaten you with death. Nature has so ordered it that as only one has given you life, so only one will take it away. 
All right. <laughs> so what is he saying here? Okay. We'll, we'll have to break this down. All right. So he's saying, okay, well, I prepare myself to deal with, with this guy. All right. In the meantime, he's going to give some advice here. Who are able and who are able to understand whence and whether you have made your way. Okay. So he, he's speaking to you. And for, and who, for what reason have an inkling of the distance yet to go? Okay. So this is, you know, if, if you, if you understand how you, how you've come here and how far you have to go, here's your instructions. Regulate your character. Okay. Rouse your courage. Stand firm in the face of things that have terrified you. Those are the three things he's saying. Okay. Do, don't count the people that inspire fear in you. Don't, don't think about all the things that you're afraid of, the people who would, would scare you. Okay. Because if you, wouldn't you think of someone that's foolish? Okay. If they were afraid of a bunch of people, in, in a place where only one could pass, right? They should only be afraid of the one <laughs> one that could access them, right? So just like there's not, there, there, there are not many who have access to slay you, okay? Even though there's a lot of people that threaten you with that. And, and he's saying something clever. He's saying it's like, look, you can only be born once and only one person can take your life. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's too much of a comfort because if you're dead, you're dead. But he's saying you don't have to fear all these people because only one of them can actually kill you. So they can't all kill you, all right? In verse 10, he says, If you had any shame, you would have let me off from paying the last installment. Still, I shall not be niggardly either, but shall discharge my debts to the last penny and force upon you what I still owe. I have never wished to cater to the crowd for what I know they do not approve and what they approve I do not know. Okay, so again, he, he's giving his, his wisdom in this letter, right? His borrowed wisdom. In verse 11, he says, Who said this, you ask? As if you were ignorant, whom I am pressing into service, it is Epicurus. But this same watchword rings in your ears from every sect. Uh, Pathetic, academic, stoic, cynic, for, for who that is pleased by virtue can please the crowd. It takes trickery to win popular approval, and you must needs, and you must needs make yourself like unto them. They will withhold their approval if they do not recognize you as one of themselves. However... What you think of yourself is much more to the point than what others think of you. The favor of ignoble men can be won only by ignoble means. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about this. So first of all, we've got the quote. The quote is, I have never wished to cater to the crowd for what I know they do not approve and what they approve I do not know. <coughs> so that's a quote, and this is a good quote, being that saying that you shouldn't cater to the crowd. You shouldn't worry about what other people think. Right? Instead, because th th whatever that the actual wisdom that you have, they don't they don't approve of that. Okay, and and what they do approve of, uh, it's it's not something that I care about. All right, and so he's saying, you know, Epicurus said this. All right, and he's saying that it 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 comes from every 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 sect, every one of these uh, philosopher sects. Okay, um, because they all say the same thing. Okay, who who who. That is pleased by virtue can please the crowd. If you are a person who actually does the right things, you, the crowd is not going to be happy. Okay, it takes trickery to win approval. You you got to be like them. Okay, or they're going to withhold their approval. Right, and so so the point of this is that the only way to get favor from people that are unworthy is to do unworthy things. Right, and so this is something that I definitely face as a creator all the time. Right. I was just doing some videos uh, from my my podcast with my wife on relationships, and I was talking about masculinity and talking about how a man should take care of the household and take care of the people and, and pay for pay for things. And, and people get so upset with that, right? And sometimes my wife Nicole, she's like, "Oh, maybe we shouldn't put this stuff out there," you know. This time. And I'm like, "No, <laughs> I don't care about what what the people say about this. This is the truth." She's like, "Yeah, I know, but they're not gonna hear it, and that's that's fine." It doesn't matter. It's still the truth, right? And so, yeah, people can complain and they can whine about this thing, but I'm not going to do the thing that's going to make them happy, that's going to get the approval of the crowd. And that's how you know you're on the right path. <clears throat> In verse 12, he says, What benefit, then, will that vaunted philosophy confer whose praises we sing and which 
we are told, is to be preferred at every art and every possession. Assuredly, it will make you prefer to please yourself rather than the populace. It will make you weigh and not merely count men's judgments. It will make you live without fear of gods or men. It will make you either overcome evils or end them. Otherwise, if I see you applauded by popular acclamation, if your entrance upon the scene is greeted by the roar and cheering and clapping, marks of distinction meet only for actors. If the whole state, even though women and the children sing your praises, how can I help pitying you? For I know what pathway leads to such popularity. Farewell. <laughs> so he's saying, look, if everyone thinks you're great, I, I actually pity you because I know, I know what you had to do to get there. I know <laughs> that the only way that the crowd is going to like you is if you're going along with the crowd. He says, you're an actor. You're fake. All right. If everybody likes you, you're fake. You're just doing what is popular at the time. And this is so true, right? Especially if you want to have some social media influence, you want people to like you. Are you fake? Do you tell them what they want to hear? Do you say the things that, that are popular in social media today? If so, you're an actor. You're fake. He pities you. He says that. Ah, no, <laughs> that's not good because Seneca knows this is, this is what it takes in order to be popular in the crowd. And this is the same applies today as it did back then. It's amazing how back then for popularity, what people would do. And then we see the same thing today on Instagram and social media. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you tomorrow.